distinguished guests, uh, dear colleagues, uh, now we continue our conference with the second panel, TB in vulnerable populations. So, I'm pleased to introduce you two co-chairs of this session that you have met earlier today with inspiring presentations. Professor Mike Ketchpol, Chief Scientist from European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, and Dr. Luchika Ditiu, Executive Secretary on Stop TB Pro uh, Partnership. Please welcome both on the stage and take a lead of the panel. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back. Um, I'm sure we all very much enjoyed a fantastic lunch. Um, so this afternoon's session is TB in vulnerable populations. Luchika and I will be co-chairing. I will be introducing the, um, the, the panel and the speakers uh, and then doing some summing up at the end. Uh, but the really hard work of moderating the, um, the panel session, Luchika will be doing that. So um, what I'd like to do first is to invite our panelists up to the stage. And what I would suggest I do is I will, if I could ask them all to come up and I'll just say a few words about them and then we will ask the first uh, keynote speaker to give a talk. So if members of the panel could please all come up. Okay, let me just introduce you to the panel, if I may start at the far end uh, there. Professor Ibrahim Abubakar is Head of TB at Public Health England in the UK and also Professor of Infectious Disease, Disease Epidemiology and Director at University College London's TB Centre. There's much more I could say about each of the uh, panelists, but I won't because we need time for discussing more important matters. Um, so next along the line we have Vera Limane, um, who is director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Research and Training in Management of MDR-TB in Latvia. And she has extensive experience of clinical and programmatic management of TB and MDR-TB. Then, I'm delighted to say uh, we have Mr. Dmitry Pinovich, who, is, um, who has a background in general medicine and business administration, but Crucially important, since 2011, Mr. Pinovich has been the first Deputy Minister of Health of the Republic of Belarus. Um, we then have Mr. Lilian Severam, who is Director of the NGO Act for Involvement uh, since 2005, which is a leading service provider for TB patients in Moldova. And I know from brief discussion I had uh, with Lillian before the, the meeting that very active involvement in uh, issues related to prisoners and other uh, vulnerable and disadvantaged groups. Um, and last, by no means least, least Mr. Tima Abdullayev, who is uh, a community activist from Uzbekistan. He has an extensive human rights background and member of governance bodies of a number of regional and international HIV and TB organizations. So I think you'll agree it's a, it's a fantastic panel, a real mixture of, of backgrounds and roles, and I really look forward to a very exciting uh, panel discussion. Uh, but before that, it is a huge pleasure, a huge pleasure to invite our uh, keynote uh, speaker, and that's Professor Michelle Kazetkin. Um, and I, have a, I said to her, I have a small book I could read about Mr. Kazetkin's um, background, but perhaps I should say that um, he is currently the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy, Envoy on HIV AIDS in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And prior to that, when I can find my notes, um, he was the second Executive Director of the Global Fund and served in this position until March 2012. So it's a real pleasure, Michelle, to invite you to give uh, the keynote speech to start this afternoon.
Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you to the organizers of the conference, to the government of Latvia uh, for inviting me, uh, for setting this conference, and for actually selecting vulnerable populations as a key theme for, for this afternoon, because I truly believe it is appropriate and important that a European conference on TB begins with uh, consideration of the TB epidemic among vulnerable people. TB has always been a disease of the poor and the vulnerable. It still is today, globally, and here in Europe. This slide that is familiar to a number of you lists medical and conditions and social contexts that may place a person at higher risk of developing TB, and poverty is on the top of the list. Poverty has long been associated with tuberculosis. Different pathways, including poor and overcrowded conditions of living, contribute to a strong positive correlation that exists between poverty either at the individual or at the country level and the incidence of tuberculosis. This particular slide shows that during the economic recession in Eastern and Central Europe in the 90s, the then noted increase in morbidity in TB, which is on the ordinate, was directly correlated with the relative decrease in GDP that the countries experienced as shown on the uh, abscissa. And more recent data from Europe shows that a 1% increase in GDP levels corresponds with a 0.38% reduction in TB incidence. So clearly, economic development is a powerful determinant of health, just as in a complementary fashion, we know that health contributes to development. Here I would like actually to differentiate between what I would call susceptibility to tuberculosis, for example, someone's medical history of diabetes or smoking that calls for medical interventions and vulnerability to, uh, to TB, which to me refers to social and human rights determinants of the disease. And so I will focus my remarks on three highly vulnerable populations, incarcerated people, people who inject drugs, and migrants, all three groups of relevance to Europe, although of different relevance to Eastern, Central, and Western Europe. But in all these three groups, vulnerability actually translates uh, into a higher risk of becoming exposed to tuberculosis, of progressing from latent infection to active disease, of not being diagnosed or of being diagnosed late, of not accessing treatment and or of not completing treatment successfully, of being discriminated and marginalized socially, including by the healthcare system, confronting catastrophic costs due to tuberculosis, and acquiring MDR-TB. Prisons. There is a large body of evidence showing that prisons are a critical vector of transmission of TB and of selection of MDR strains. In prisons, overcrowding, the relatively higher prevalence of people who inject drugs and of HIV infection among inmates, difficulties in isolating inmates for treatment, poor implementation of infection control, late case detection, often lower cure rates, and release to community prior to completion of treatment all contribute to an increased TB transmission rate in prison and between prison and the general population. A review of the literature has shown an average 23 times higher incidence of TB in prisons than in the general population. Actually, surveys in the WHO Euro region 
have shown a 5 to 85 times higher TB prevalence among prisoners as compared with the general civilian population. And what this particular slide shows is that there is an average 6.4% um, new TB cases in the WHO Euro region uh, registered among uh, inmates. It also shows that this proportion significantly differs in the eastern part of the continent, 7.4% as you can see, if you can read it, uh, and uh, as compared to the western part, 1.6%. And in 2000, coming back to the eastern part of the continent, in 2013, a study had showed a direct log relationship between the average TB incidence shown here on the ordinate and the incarceration rates in Eastern Europe, here shown on the abscissa, and you know that Eastern Europe is actually one of the regions where incarcerated, incarceration rates rank among the highest in the world. There's also evidence that a history of incarceration increases the risk for an individual to develop MDR-TB, and at a population level, there are studies showing differ that differences in incarceration levels are actually associated with differences in incidence and prevalence of MDR-TB. And as I said earlier, TB transmitted in prisons is not only a risk in prisons, it is also a risk to the community, to healthcare workers, to guards and family, and failure to follow up after release uh, is, is common and prison outbreaks uh, have been linked with increased TB incidence in the community. WHO, UNODC, uh, and the ICRC recently released a guidance document on prisons and health, including tuberculosis. And the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Diseases has also issued a statement urging health authorities to prioritize TB prevention and control in penitentiary settings, including recommendations on ensuring the continuum of care for released prisoners who are on treatment for TB. Igor was released from prison and he came back to his hometown, Kirovograd, and went straight to the TB clinic following the recommendation of his prison doctor but the TB clinic did not accept him. But that time he was extremely weak and did not have anywhere to go. So he just let down in the park of the TB clinic, shirtless, and stayed there for three nights. After an intervention by one of the local NGOs, he was accepted at the TB clinic. He had an open MDR-TB form. The TB clinic argued that they had to insist on discipline before taking such a patient and the number of hospital beds and resources for drugs are limited. Eager died on the fifth day of hospitalization. People who inject drugs. There's an estimated four million people who inject drugs in Europe. This slide shows that among the risk factors examined, injection drug use was found in this particular study Injection drug use was found to be the highest risk for acquiring MDR-TB in the European region. As you would know, over the last 30 years, illicit drugs have become much more widely available in Europe, and new synthetic injectable drugs are appearing on the market every day. At the same time, HIV-AIDS, particularly in the eastern part of our continent, and hepatitis C associated with drug use have increased dramatically, and so has TB. People who inject drugs experience high TB prevalence due to poverty, unemployment, homelessness, incarceration, HIV infection, and lack of access to health care. There aren't so many reports on TB prevalence, not so many figures on TB prevalence among people using drugs, but we know that people using drugs, injecting drugs with HIV, have actually a two to six fold increased risk of developing TB as compared to those who are non-injectors. However, high rates of symptomatic TB have been reported in a few countries, including Greece, 
Lithuania, Portugal, and we know that TB rates among people who inject drugs increase with age, years of drug use, and with HIV infection. So early detection of TB and care are key elements of the package of interventions that WHO, UNAIDS, and UNODC jointly recommend as a healthcare uh, package of interventions for people who inject drugs. Treatment of latent infection, infection after, of course, exclusion of active disease, is, we know, effective, including in people living with HIV. Early diagnosis and um, treatment and INH prophylaxis are, we know, or should be key for TB control in people using drug living with HIV. Uh, and I guess the panel that, uh, to which I will actually leave the job of presenting best practices and how to deal with these issues, I'm sure we'll talk about the need for integrated comprehensive services um, that would integrate HIV and TB, and in this particular case, also comprehensive management uh, of uh, people who inject drugs, experienced, experienced health sector teams and social workers that actually are best placed to monitor treatment, to detect um, side effects, and, and to maximize adherence and compliance to both HIV and TB treatments. Um, Dasha Osheret, in one of her questions this morning, uh, pointed out, and I'd like to come back on this, uh, the harmful role played by punitive drug policies and laws that, as a result of criminalization, drive users away from prevention and care services. Drug users actually face tremendous barriers to accessing health services in, in Europe. Fear of police and stigma drive people who use drugs underground, away from prevention and away from treatment. People who use drugs are arrested and those who are suspect of drug, sus just suspected of drug offenses are also often subject to police harassment, police violence, abuse of power, and extortion. And as a physician, I'm also sorry to say that stigma and discrimination are also often present within healthcare settings, leading to refusal of services, absurd requirements to be drug-free as a precondition for treatment, registration requirements and breaches of confidentiality. In some countries, healthcare workers are legally obliged to report drug users to the police, a powerful disincentive to accessing healthcare. The WHO guidance emphasizes the need for governments to create what's called enabling legislative and policy environments that could minimize the negative healthcare impact of over-repressive law enforcement and drug policies. Incarceration for minor drug offenses is one of the main reasons behind the increase in prison populations globally and in our region particularly, and as I have said, incarceration is by itself a major factor for acquiring and developing TB. So the emphasis on drug law enforcement has also created in many countries legal barriers to evidence-based HIV and TB prevention measures, such as the provision of clean syringes, needles, and methadone maintenance therapy. The result is that only eight out of 100 injectors currently receive opioid substitute therapy at this time. Methadone, as you know, is still illegal in Russia and access to it far too limited in most countries in Central and Eastern Europe. However, achieving adherence and completion of treatment may be difficult for drug users who experience a, let's say, chaotic lifestyle. So opioid substitute therapy is the answer that provides patients with the stability they need for the compliance to treatment. Olga lives in Odessa and she has been injecting drugs for over 25 years. My life, she says, was a nightmare. My day started and ended with one and the same thought, drugs, money, drugs. 
This life has destroyed my family and my health. When I lost my job, problems with law enforcement quickly followed. Eventually, I got into prison where I was diagnosed with TB and HIV. I decided my life was over. The world around me was of no interest anymore. I neglected my health, which led to a dramatic deterioration of my condition. I was dying. One of my friends told me about the methadone-assisted treatment. He took me to Odessa TB treatment clinic, where I underwent thorough medical examination. From that moment, I started regaining the hope to change my life. And as a participant to the methadone program, I was able to start TB treatment and then antiretroviral treatment. I had access to counseling and to the doctors free of charge at the regional TB treatment clinic, TB treatment clinic, methadone. I restored relations with my parents and made new friends. If I had not learned about the program in due time, the chances were that I would not be alive at this moment and I would not be able to share my joy and belief that one's life can always get better. Migration. Migration both within and between countries, as everyone knows, in Europe and worldwide has increased in recent years. While migration in itself need not to present a risk for health, it is in fact characterized by increased vulnerability to disease and to inequalities in access to care. Human migration from high incidence countries to Europe has increased. This slide shows the proportion in red of TB cases among people of foreign origin or citizenship in countries across Europe. As you may see, a significant proportion, that is 20 to 70 percent of TB cases notified in Europe are among foreign-born populations. The incidence of TB among foreign-born people living in Europe is up to 50 times higher than that in native populations. Migrants from high TB prevalence countries may be at risk of TB before they leave their country, during resettlement, and of course, after resettlement. As shown on this slide, and um, foreign-born people, sorry, as shown on this slide, I'll skip the other one, uh, foreign-born people often face barriers to care in a new country, and as a result of inadequate knowledge as a result of inadequate knowledge of or coverage of by, by the healthcare services. Difference in culture, language, lack of money, comorbidity with HIV, concern about discrimination, fear of expulsion. Asylum seekers are often not permitted to work in Europe and while experiencing a greater burden of ill health are uh, of course unable to afford private care. Many experience lack of cultural sensitivity also, or lack of language skills. They may fear discrimination and they may feel that their disease could actually jeopardize their visa applications. Cross-border migrants are often skilled temporary migrants performing services abroad with no intention to sell, settle or seek permanent employment in the host countries. They include legal and undocumented migrants, internal migrants, and also mobile occupational persons such as truck drivers. And finally, in that category of people, in addition to migrants, asylum seekers, temporary cross-border migrants, mobile communities in Europe and Roma populations, as we know tend to cluster in pockets of economic deprivation in our cities with high risk of TB and needs that are poorly understood by the uh, authorities. So culturally sensitive TB services in Europe should really be offered uh, with access to diagnosis and treatment to immigrants in compliance with human rights obligations and also in compliance with strategies to control TB in migrant communities. Um, including contact tracing at the primary health care services, which I'm sure the panel discuss, will discuss may be more cost effective than general screening uh, of new entrants at the border. There are a number of best practices um, that maybe uh, we will 
discuss, sorry, something wrong with the slides here. Um, um, Norway, for example, allows all immigrant uh, migrants to stay in the country while possible TB disease is being in completed and uh, in, in the country. WHO Euro has worked with TB managers to define a minimum package um, of cross-border control and care to address issues such as the continuity of care, information during migration, and the availability of and access to health services in the new country. And I believe it is important that this particular conference really discusses how this expert opinion can now be translated into bilateral and multilateral political agreements, including funding for treatment and care at regional and sub-regional panel. So in brief, vulnerability is about both access to care and about a person's right to care. And ultimately, it is a political issue. Health is politics. The epidemiology of TB and MDR-TB and the analysis of vulnerable populations provide some of the strongest evidence, I think, of the effects of political variables on population health. Just think of the introduction of austerity policies and their subsequent health effects in some of our European uh, countries and around the globe. I believe that's a clear illustration of this. TB affects those that are the weakest in our societies. And as we reflect on what is lacking in our interventions to prevent and control this disease, we have to reflect on the inequities in our societies that TB and vulnerability are revealing. This means that the response to TB uh, and to the TB crisis among the vulnerable requires a whole of government, multi-sectoral commitment that extends beyond the health sector. It also means that we will make no progress unless equity and human rights are at the very center of what we do. Vulnerability with regard to health, whatever the facts and circumstances that have generated it, predisposes people to exclusion and poorer respect for their rights. And conversely, poor access to rights and exclusion generate vulnerability. Health, or the absence of it, is a powerful driver of human rights. And respect for human rights is crucial for good health. Promoting public health and building health systems are one crucial way for governments to realize health and rights. At the same time, rights-based approaches that address economic and social vulnerability will allow us to control epidemics. The, one, the two go hand in hand. So, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, as we embark in this discussion, let us remember that universal rights are also the rights of the vulnerable, the right to health and to decent care, the right to freedom from discrimination, the rights to equality before the law, to privacy, to work, to education, the right to share in the advances of sciences. We cannot win the fight against tuberculosis without also winning the fight for these rights and without exercising what Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has called in his latest report on the SDGs, the national and international leadership in the service of the people. Thank you very much for your attention. Professor Kazakin, thanks very much indeed for an inspiring talk. Um, now, the next, we have a brief video presentation uh, to follow. Um, this is a presentation by Dr. Eric Gusby, who, as many of you know, is the United Nations Secretary General's Special Envoy on Tuberculosis and has been so since January of this year. 
He also serves as Professor of Medicine and Director of the Institute for Global Health Delivery and Diplomacy in Global Health Sciences at the University of California in San Francisco. Anyway, I'm hoping that in a moment a video will appear uh, and after that we will then go into the panel discussion. Start the video, please. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to address you today as the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy on Tuberculosis. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of this important meeting for giving me the opportunity to address you. Let me also congratulate the Latvian Presidency of the Council of the European Union and the Ministry of Health of Latvia for organizing this important multi-stakeholder meeting to discuss tuberculosis and multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Ladies and gentlemen, globally, the achievements in the fight against tuberculosis have been monumental. The 2015 Millennium Development Goal of halting and reversing TB incidence has been achieved globally. Furthermore, the TB mortality rate fell by an estimated 45% between 1990 and 2013, and the TB prevalence rate fell by 41% during the same period. This translates to more than 37 million lives saved from TB. These are people living in the most unprivileged and impoverished segments of the society, both in resource-rich and resource-poor countries who are at the prime of their lives. A new molecular test has substantially cut the time needed for diagnosis of tuberculosis has been rolled out and two new drugs were added to the fight against TB. In the European region, since 2001, TB incidence has been falling at an average rate of 4.5 percent per year, which is the fastest decline in the world. I very much appreciate the intense efforts exerted in your region to address TB and MDR-TB including the development and progress towards the targets of the Consolidated Action Plan to Prevent and Combat Multidrug and Extensively Drug-Resistant Tuberculosis in the WHO European Region from 2011 to 2015. I particularly acknowledge the priority given to TB and MDR-TB by the WHO Regional Director. Under this plan, the capacity of countries to detect multidrug-resistant TB has increased by 40 percent, and this region is the first to have reached universal access to testing and treatment for multidrug-resistant TB. Despite these achievements, over the last two decades, the fight against tuberculosis is far from over. Of the 27 high MDR TB burden countries in the world, 15 are in the European region. In addition, HIV-associated TB continues to increase in the region. Both of these factors have exacerbated treatment success rates, with currently only half of those detected with MDR-TB successfully cured. Globally, absence of universal health coverage aggravates the economic burden on the poor. This is compounded by a lack of social protection mechanisms to address associated income loss and non-medical costs. Weak health systems prevent establishing linkages required across social sectors to address poverty, undernutrition, and risk factors that adversely influence people's vulnerability to tuberculosis and health outcomes of people with tuberculosis. Ladies and gentlemen, these are exactly the gaps the new WHO NTB strategy, which all of you endorsed during the last World Health Assembly, will address. The NTB strategy has an ambitious target of ending the tuberculosis epidemic by 2035 with reduction of tuberculosis mortality by 95 percent and TB incidence by 80 percent. A key challenge facing the realization of these targets, particularly in your region, is the burden of drug-resistant TB. This challenge requires the highest attention as it poses global health security concern. Ending the tuberculosis epidemic will require substantially increased domestic investments, effective engagements of both the public and private sectors, and unblocking barriers within the health system. In this regard, I would like to highlight the health financing reform of TB prevention and control interventions in the WHO European region. This is an important task that has to be expedited 
so that we can realize the end of the TB epidemic in this region. I strongly believe the European region is at a historical crossroad to realize the end of the TB epidemic throughout its geographic coverage as it was observed in its western parts almost half a century ago. I wish you all the very best in your deliberations of the meeting. Thank you. So with this, actually it would have been good for Eric to be here because I would have liked to challenge him because I think a lot of the people we saved with what we did were actually people like us and not necessarily those from the vulnerable groups. Uh, and this is exactly why we wanted to have this panel here because I think in spite of all our efforts consistently over the last six, seven years, we are missing three million cases every year from those esti uh, estimated uh, to exist by WHO. And that's because very likely most of these people are part of the groups that were presented by Michelle and are part of the groups for which we need an additional extra effort. We need to go a step closer. It requests more attention. It requests more money. Uh, they are not part of the groups that are the easiest to deal with. Uh, they are not part of our conversations that much. Uh, they cannot uh, give a feedback on how we think we can work together. So therefore, they are um, much uh, difficult to reach, diagnose, and find, and put on treatment. So uh, we are all very pleased to have this panel here. Uh, and what we will try to do, and I really hope that uh, we will have an interactive room. It's not very common that we have such a great audience, but also, uh, as already my colleague said, such a, a great panel in, have, in, in which we have a mixture of you know, people affected, NGOs, the government, technical, the TB program. So it's the perfect balance to discuss this. So I really want everyone in the room to have a chance. If you have a question or a comment, don't be shy. Just raise your hand that we can have a good discussion. So what we will do in the panel, we will go over some question, uh, you know, trying to get the perspective of everyone. And the questions will be uh, in, like grouped into three pieces. One is what we think are the main issues in, in addressing and in getting uh, the vulnerable groups uh, part of the, our programs and to reach them. Uh, what are uh, the challenges that we are facing uh, in addressing the vulnerable groups? And then is like what can we do different and how can we practically change this? But I don't want you to go through all of this. I'll just start with the first question. And I will start here with Vaira, uh, with her great experience uh, in the Latvian program. So Vaira, if you can um, elaborate a bit from your experience, what do you think are the main issues that we are facing in addressing TB in the vulnerable groups? I think it works, just go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yeah, it's working. Um, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to be in this panel. And uh, I would like uh, to uh, to say that I am very pleased that that I have this possibility to talk here. Um, and this, in this very important meeting for Latvia, for Latvian tuberculosis program, and in general uh, with um, uh, European partnership countries and discussing all together this uh, vulnerable population issue in light of the new uh, WHO strategy and uh, TB and in, in, uh, in time when we they started to develop um, new plans for uh, <clears throat> tuberculosis um, control after 2015. Uh, <clears throat> vulnerable population, it's not only discussion about vulnerable population, it's not only discussion about uh, patients uh, who uh, is sick with TB and touch with this disease. 
but uh, it is a problem which uh, covers all society, all uh, needs of society and what we are uh, expecting from uh, society and how uh, everyone can be involved in, in this um, TV control. Um, after 20 years of uh, implementation of tuberculosis control program in Latvia, we have achieved a lot. We have uh, achieved the decrease of TB incidence uh, twofold and the um, decrease of multidrug resistance tuberculosis five times. And it's a question, what is the next? It's enough or, or what, uh, what is the problem at this moment? And um, if we look on our epidemiological data that we can see easily that um, there is a, a proportional increase for MDRTB, that proportional increase for XDRTB and TB HIV. And uh, looking on vulnerable populations that Again, proportion of vulnerable population also is uh, not uh, going down as much as we want. Um, and the, uh, one of the problems I would like to touch is the programmatic issue that um, uh, do we know how many, how big problem we have with vulnerable populations in each of the country and uh, how uh, many uh, new or additional activities we need to implement to, uh, to uh, solve these problems. Um, and uh, this uh, such mapping of problems could help us in planning and uh, for targeted interventions in these vulnerable populations. Another issue is um, that this kind of uh, people don't seek, seek uh, medical care themselves very often and there is many many reasons for this. They don't have, uh, sometimes, they have bad uh, living conditions, social conditions. They sometimes don't take care about their health. They don't have easy access to medical care because they don't have money, because it's uh, far from, from them, etc. And this is uh, one of the biggest obstacles in their, uh, their case detection among this population. And from uh, another side, those who come and th th these who c start treatment, they have a lot of difficulties to receive this treatment, to complete this treatment. And what happens is that uh, medical uh, uh, care system lost this patient from follow-up. They started to interrupt, later lost uh, completely. And um, uh, these patients develop from sensitive tuberculosis to MDR tuberculosis to XDR tuberculosis and, and <clears throat> later is uh, difficult to cure. They left not, not treated, living in these bad conditions. The transmission is very high. And uh, MDR TB, TB among these populations is much higher than in, in uh, the whole population. Um, and this, of course, not only medical problem, that it's a social problem. And what we can do, that we should uh, uh, help these people to, to uh, with these social problems, to get them uh, for care, for treatment, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Vaira.
Um, I'm looking now at uh, Mr. Pinevich from uh, uh, your position as uh, the first uh, Deputy Minister of Health in Belarus. Um, and um, I would like if you can reflect a bit from your perspective on the, on the vulnerable groups, but also on something that Vaira said about we don't necessarily know how big the number of migrants is in the country or the drug users. But what I think is that that should not stop us in going ahead and, you know, and being bold and ambitious and have targets for reaching them with services. What is your perspective in terms of knowing the situation and issues with the vulnerable groups in Belarus? Thank you very much. I'll uh, speak Russian, please uh, take your phones. Uh, okay. Dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Latvian side for uh, the hospitality, for the uh, organization of the present event and for the topicality of all the issues uh, which have been raised. Our country uh, refers to the uh, uh, region where uh, the uh, TB burden is very high and uh, one of the uh, three uh, patients are uh, infected with uh, MDRTB and these are very high uh, rates and when 10 years ago we started working on the national program uh, together with our uh, colleagues uh, uh, from the Global Fund uh, we organized uh, two programs and uh, uh, as well as our Latvian colleagues we also managed to reduce uh, in TB incidence by 60 percent we improved the 100 percent treatment successful treatment of sensitive TB but now this problem is beyond medical issues and now working out our third program we have uh, decided uh, to join efforts with uh, experts from the Ministry of Finance and other groups uh, so that uh, to uh, achieve something. And uh, proceeding from our uh, experience, I uh, want to say that uh, uh, monitoring, uh, monitoring and surveillance are uh, crucial to work out clear-cut rules for our work and uh, as far as vulnerable groups are concerned in Belarus of course they are associated with risk factors 30 percent of all the new TB patients are uh, either alcohol or drug abusers a little bit less than uh, 10 percent from that uh, TB cohort are uh, HIV infected with all the associated problems and uh, a bit more than 10% are those who have gone through the penitentiary system and uh, working uh, on our uh, intersectoral uh, program we proceeded from our experience and uh, first of all uh, the main element is monitoring uh, then good clinical protocols uh, for treatment and we do have them together with our uh, Latvian colleagues we have uh, prepared three clinical protocols uh, which uh, have proved to be quite successful but as they say the devil is in the details and all issues uh, which are so characteristic for vulnerable uh, people mm, hamper our efforts and when uh, we uh, worked together with our partners we proceeded from the 
following uh, prerequisites. So first, to, we uh, are supposed to consider uh, vulnerable groups uh, outside the TB context because uh, drug addiction, alcoholism are uh, also very uh, great uh, challenges. So we started addressing these challenging uh, challenges and uh, we managed to uh, reduce uh, consumption of alcohol in the country by uh, 21 percent per uh, by two percent uh, sorry by two liters uh, per capita uh, when it comes to drug addiction and uh, uh, hiv infection we uh, have adopted several uh, laws uh, uh, regulating uh, the situation with uh, drug addiction we have a broad network of methadone repl uh, replacement uh, therapy and uh, apart from our colleagues uh, from the Ukraine and uh, Russia our program uh, methadone uh, replacement therapy is uh, quite a success and it is going to uh, be continued as far as HIV infection is concerned, by the year 2020, we have a target to, uh, uh, to increase uh, our uh, comprehensive uh, involvement and we uh, hope to uh, stabilize uh, uh, the number of those who are in need of uh, antiretroviral uh, retroviral, uh, therapy. And uh, we have already taken a decision to establish centers for re-socialization, kinds of uh, rehabilitation uh, of uh, persons who have gone through the penitentiary system. And uh, uh, fortunately, we uh, haven't had any cases like the one uh, presented here and people uh, released from prison uh, are uh, taken care of. They are uh, brought to our um, hospitals. So our mutual problem is uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance but uh, uh, according to uh, Bloomberg's uh, estimates we are one of the best uh, countries as far as access to medical care is concerned but uh, unfortunately what we lack is control over the use of antibiotics so we have taken a state decision to limit the turnover of antibiotics in the country and uh, the second element of uh, our work is uh, introduction of targeted uh, packages uh, for uh, TB patients to incentivize them not to interrupt uh, and interrupt uh, therapy and uh, uh, we are going to cover their transportation uh, expenses and will take other measures. And uh, another aspect that is the role of NGOs. And uh, here we uh, really lack a lot. We have uh, the uh, Red Cross and the Red Crescent societies, uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders uh, have come to us. And uh, the third program we are going to realize uh, will be associated with the involvement of NGOs. So the patient will have to uh, go through the medical system and receive treatment and uh, NGOs are to help us in that. Thank you. I, <clears throat> I really um, very much appreciated what you said at the end 
And um, I, I welcome uh, this initiative of the Belarusian government to understand there are services and groups of populations that can be much easier reached by the NGOs. Whatever the legislation is, working with vulnerable groups, with certain vulnerable groups, it's much easier than if the NGOs are doing that work. And I'm happy to hear this from you. I hope this will go ahead because only that we will be able to achieve something. Assuming that the government will be able to cover everybody, it's a mistake. And that's why uh, I, I welcome what you said very much. Timur, you are, a, you are a lawyer, you are a human rights lawyer, you are as well a TB survivor, and um, I wanted to, you know, to ask your perspective, not only on the issues, but also on the, it's very easy in dealing with vulnerable groups to kind of, as, 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 as health staff kind of, to, to feel that they don't play the ball as much as we would like, and to in a way say, we know, you know, it's, difficult, they, they, they don't really understand or care. What are the issues that actually we should think differently and what can we do differently to really embrace the TB vulnerable groups? And what do you think are the major issues in reaching them? Thank you very much, Alechika. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm slightly, I'm, I'm not slightly, I'm, I'm considerably impressed by the presentation of, of uh, Professor Kazachkin. And, uh, you know, after his presentation, it's, it's sometimes difficult to add something in terms of, like, how to work with vulnerable populations, though I personally prefer key affected populations. Um, so, basically, uh, you know, the easiest thing that can be done to effectively address the vulnerable communities or key affected communities would be to have ideal laws which do not criminalize, would be to change the, the attitudes in the society in a way that people don't marginalize, they don't treat with prejudice those who are, um, you know, don't believe the way that it's supposed to be right. Um, I mean, there are many ideal solutions. None of them is totally viable in this real world. So um, I would say that, in my opinion, it would be crucial to continue the move that is already there. Uh, TB used to be just a couple of years ago. It was a purely medical uh, issue. And um, I kept on saying that TB is overly medicalized. TB responses are overly medicalized. During past half like the uh, past two years, I, I started hearing um, people who actually come with, from, from medical field, um, the public officials, saying that it is important to take into account uh, social determinants, that it's important to uh, keep in mind human rights, not just uh, the medical aspect of fighting with TB. And uh, to me, that's very good and I, I, I really hope that at some point we will come to the, to the situation where actually we don't speak about TB as a disease but we speak uh, about TB as a really social phenomenon which has to be tackled accordingly and uh, which, which has to, to be perceived as um, you know the, the, the complex issue that requires complex response. And by saying that it requ requires complex response or comprehensive response, I mean that there have to be measures aimed at improving legislation. Um, why we have this um, I idea of vulnerable communities? It's not because they're just vulnerable to the disease. It it's because they also live in the conditions which make them vulnerable. Uh, they are marginalized, they're criminalized, they are poor, and uh, sometimes basically their lifestyle makes them uh, decide to, to, do, to do crimes which actually bring them to another community which is like penitentiaries. So um, I, I really think that uh, if we continue considering that TB is not just a medical, it's not just a disease, it's, it, it's something more and the response has to be more comprehensive, then we, maybe we will be more effective. When I look at the, at the graphs that we had this morning on the, on the screen, like how we want to eradicate TB, 
I mean, that's a, that's a good scenario, you know, to come to zero. I personally have these two pins here, which one, one says stop TB, the other says end TB. I mean, I, I, that's, that's what I want, but how do we do that? Do we do that only with treatments? Mm, partially. Do we do that with improved diagnosis? Yes, but not completely. What, what else does it take to, to actually come to the point when uh, we, we really see that TB is no longer a problem in our world? And it takes a lot, to be honest. It takes efforts of everyone and not just governments. Though governments have probably more uh, leverage to, 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 to um, reduce TB, uh, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's, it's also communities, affected communities. Without involving people who had TB, you know, it's, it's difficult to convince sometimes for a medical doctor who doesn't know what it, what it is uh, to, to have TB. For, for this doctor, it's, it may be difficult to convince how important it is to complete the treatment and that actually it's realistic. Sometimes by simply by talking to someone who had TB in the past, the, 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 the person who has TB will, will be more convinced that actually, you know, TB is really curable and it's not just a good slogan, TB is preventable and curable. Um, so I think that uh, civil society, communities of people affected by the diseases, NGOs, service providers, you know, it, it has to be a concerted action and I really mean it, I don't want it to be a nice declaration, let's, you know, be together. I really mean it. Let, let us fight TB together. And uh, without civil societies, I don't think that the response would be effective without engaging. And sometimes what it takes to engage is actually to first mobilize uh, the communities of people affected by the TB. I don't think we can really achieve this, you know, the, the nice things I have on my pins, ending TB. I, I really think that um, whenever, when, when we uh, speak about countries that are effectively tackling TB, I, I, I'm sure that you will see that it's not just, you know, giving out drugs. It's not just testing. It's, it's more than that. So my answer would be we have to work on this together. We have to involve communities and civil societies and when there are no communities, which is a situation in many of our countries, um, is to support the emerging of this of these communities. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Abu Bakar. I, I'm, you know, we speak here a lot of um, what do we think, what do you feel. You you worked with many different patients. You are the head of the UK program. From your experience, what are the things that you, what are the main issues that you saw in addressing TB in vulnerable groups? And do you have some example of things that worked or best approaches that you can share with us? Thank you very much, Lichika. So I would respond to your question with, um, three, in three different uh, bits. The first point I'd like to cover is um, how we engage or respond to the epidemic. And I'll start that with um, the mantra from the HIV community, which is know your epidemic. I think the problem that we deal with with vulnerable populations, even though we give them this common term, would differ in each setting and each community. And if you're trying to tackle your problem, the first step, as already alluded to in the presentation, is defining who is affected and therefore thinking through how you respond to it. There's a second element to that which I think is as important, if not more important, which is our simplistic approach of, especially those of us from disease-based programs, of thinking of TB and the condition as the only thing that we want to address. I think it's fundamental we realize that human beings have a myriad of problems. Even simply looking at comorbidities such as HIV, hepatitis, we know that they're disproportionately represented in vulnerable populations. So unlike your typical TB patient who pitches up in your clinic that is wealthy, a lawyer or a doctor, if you're dealing with someone from a vulnerable population, you must make every contact count. You must think through all of their problems and not just their TB problem. Otherwise, you end up with the consequences we discuss over and over again about non-compliance because, of course, there are other priorities in life apart from TB. So someone may not be taking their medicines because they have other issues. The second point I'd like to cover, which I think is equally important, is our advocacy and how we link up with communities. 
without a doubt, compared to a decade or two ago, we've gone so, so far from where we were in terms of engaging communities. We have fantastic advocacy groups within Europe. Civil society is a lot more engaged than it was. But I couldn't help thinking, listening to the discussion today, that the number of advocates that have spoken come from a subset of the community. I think we need that, and we need more of that, i.e. articulate individuals that we can relate to and say, gosh, this could be me, and therefore TV is important. But beyond that, we need two other groups. The first is particularly vulnerable people who cannot actually articulate their views in the same way. We need to find a way to listen to these individuals because it's only through truly understanding their perspective that we can design solutions to meet the, their needs. In the UK, for example, where we develop um, guidelines for the management of TB, our National Institute for Clinical Excellence has a particular model where they pay for the time and training and support to people who normally would have a zero chance of standing in front of you to speak. And in the small rooms where we develop guidelines, they get a voice and they get to communicate exactly what it is the guidelines should say. And you'd be amazed how the perspective of such a person can put down the view of the most senior consultant physician in the room because they get it and they've been through it. This, the last group that I think we ought to engage are the movie star, superstar status. And I know the Chica and the Stop TV partnership do a decent job of attracting such, but we need more of them. Sometimes a simple word from someone that the politicians are willing to listen to can make a big difference in whether you get resources or not. The last area I'd like to cover is research. And we've had a great deal of discussion this morning about research, but I think it's particularly important in this community. And here, I don't mean simply finding the next magic bullet of a drug or a vaccine, because we know already that even the tools we've got are particularly not working well for these populations. And I think the answer in this community actually lies in what Kunot was mentioning this morning of operational research. The ability to define exactly how we deliver interventions that work in other communities, tailoring them spe to specific situations, and getting more effective interventions. And to my mind, this needs to be a bit more than the add-on we have. I mean, we were talking this morning about the size of envelope for TB being 2 billion globally, uh, the, our aspirations being too low. If you think critically about operational research, we're only talking about 80 million. That's the target, I think, annually. And of that, a fraction of that will go to vulnerable communities. How on earth do you think we can organize effective programs in populations that are hard to reach or hard to treat, or services that are hard to reach or hard to treat, if we don't invest more in doing that? I was listening to a colleague this morning who was describing to me a service that has been uh, designed in a member state uh, to tackle TB in immigrants and screen them. And you go to a different place, for your blood test, you go to a different place to your skin test, and you go to a different appointment for your chest x-ray. And these appointments are purposely put through a narrow window that you can only attend if you are free at that point in time. If we don't think through this and change these systems, address health system issues, and do the right research that means we can translate effective systems, such as the one in the Netherlands, uh, the Rotterdam one-stop shop service that many of you I'm sure have heard about, where you could go to one place and address a myriad of problems from social security issues to your treatment all in one place, or we reach out in the community with mobile x-ray vans, I think we're not going to change anything. Finally, I'd like to finish with one example of operational research that we conducted in the UK that I think demonstrates how research could lead to a, um, advocacy and solutions. So for years, we borrowed a van um, tried it out in London to treat uh, vulnerable groups in London, find cases of TB and treat them. We got enough funding to actually buy one of those vans. Eventually, it became clear that that's what we need to engage those uh, vulnerable communities in London. But the funding wasn't forthcoming to actually carry out this activity on a sustainable manner. It was only when we conducted an independent evaluation using thorough science and cost-effectiveness analysis and actually demonstrated to the health system that it's actually cost-effective and indeed cost-saving eventually if you has, have such an intervention that our advocates were able to use that, promote that at the parliament and promote to the health system and get that funded. I'm delighted to say there are not only two vans now um, going around London screening people um, and detecting cases, but there's a whole set of service attached to it that ensures that when people are detected, they are then followed up to ensure that they get treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much. And from what you said, I think it's a, it's a mixture of, of getting more evidence of what it works, but it's also combined with 
putting in practice and scale up or push forward what we know already is working. Because I think that even with what we know we can do, we are still not doing the maximum we can do. And I wanted, uh, Lilian, you have a, a great practical experience in Moldova dealing with vulnerable groups but also with governments and also having uh, international exposure as well. From your perspective, what are some of the practical things that you can share with us or your view in, in how to really catch uh, up with the work on vulnerable groups? Um, thank you, Lucica. Um, I think it's crucial to have uh, in place uh, a very well-coordinated uh, process of interventions among vulnerable groups because usually vulnerable groups are under the custody or under supervision of uh, certain state uh, services. For example, a homeless person can be in uh, the supervision or custody of municipal services and suddenly this person can become a prisoner and uh, a prisoner can become a homeless after release. Um, all those vulnerable groups uh, are extremely um, um, exposed to, to the risk of getting TB and uh, we have to have a real coordination and a very effective coordination to, uh, to be able to trace them, to be able to give them the same, um, the same uh, quality services uh, whenever they are. Um, in the same time, stigma and discrimination, this is, this is a real problem that uh, make impossible the access to these groups. We have to try to reduce it. We have to fight with discrimination and stigma. And uh, we also have to bring to these groups the legal advice. Uh, we have to give them the possibility to um, be protecting, protected from the legal point of view. We have already experience in, in uh, the protection of HIV patients. Uh, litigation and legal protection and that gives you good results um, in order to create more access to services and to change the attitude of, uh, of uh, society members towards them. Uh, sure, we have to involve NGOs and I think we have to think about uh, sustainability and we have to um, create models that would finance uh, the involvement of NGOs um, the interventions of NGOs because NGOs and charities can be uh, very effective in getting to that vulnerable populations like homeless, ex-inmates, prisons, um, drug users. Um, and we should invite, invite all those service providers in harm reduction that have so much experience during the years to get on board and to, to help us also because they have a lot of experience, a lot of um, access to the most vulnerable uh, groups. Okay, thank you. I will turn back to the room now. So while you prepare your, your points or your questions, so you know we don't move to the next set of questions till we have three from the room. So um, while you think about this, um, one of the issues that we will, we will discuss afterwards and will appear much more tomorrow is related to the sustainability of the investments. And with the support of several big donors in the region, uh, the biggest being the Global Fund, as we know, there are some very great programs uh, addressing vulnerable groups that are implementing in our countries. And one of the questions that we will all go and ask to the best including uh, Mike from uh, ECDC, is what we, how we can support our own governments and decision makers to ensure that there will be investments maintained in TB, but that there will be a focus on what we already built with the vulnerable groups. So that will be the next question that we will all take together. But in the meantime, are there any questions or comments or reflections from the room related to the um, uh, vulnerable groups? Lasha. We have already two. Just a second. Is Lasha and then, okay. Yeah. Hello, my name is Lasha Guguadze. I represent the Federation of Red Cross in Geneva. 
Uh, thanks. Thank you very much for interesting uh, discussion. So, I mean, we talk a lot about investment, donors, etc. But there are certain things, certain uh, changes that that we can make at the, in the, at the country level without the big investment. I mean, maybe this is the question comes to to to, to representative of the, the the Belarusia. So, is there anything that really can be done without big investment? Uh, big, uh, really, donor contributions. I, I'm sure there are some things uh, that can be done without waiting uh, funding and money coming from abroad with the goodwill and with acknowledging all the seriousness of the problem. Thank you. So, Lasha challenged us a little bit, uh, 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 Belarus, but I think all of us, uh, of things that can be done without. Uh, necessary uh, having uh, big investments uh, in order to address the vulnerable groups. I think uh, uh, we go ahead, uh, you try and answer, and then we have uh, two more hands in the room, three more hands. Okay. Thank you. Over the 10 years, the volume of uh, global fund investment amounted to 8% of all the financial means directed towards fighting TB. I can't say, being honest, that uh, international investments have uh, become the very basis uh, for our uh, public anti-TB program. But what is important, uh, along with uh, resources from the Global Fund or other uh, organizations, uh, we um, manage to uh, uh, we manage to redirect uh, assets from uh, uh, big clinics to outpatient clinics. We may uh, 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 and with the help of. Uh, non-governmental uh, resources, we manage to teach uh, the uh, vulnerable population uh, how to behave in case of TB. We, we also uh, managed to uh, incentivize uh, representatives of uh, the medical community to work with the vulnerable uh, population. And uh, the results we have achieved are quite impressive. And uh, then uh, the state may intervene and uh, start uh, financing social uh, packages. One of the elements which has proved to be quite successful uh, is uh, working uh, with the behavioral aspect. And uh, very often we uh, manage to uh, we 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 manage to secure uh, procurement of necessary uh, medicines and uh, to secure. Uh, uh, uninterrupted treatment. So working with uh, international organizations for us is uh, the possibility uh, to create uh, algorithms. Unfortunately, our government uh, does not uh, trust uh, completely to our own specialists. Uh, but maybe after today's uh, conference, uh, I will uh, manage uh, to uh, uh, lobby uh, the uh, decision makers. And our main task uh, is to achieve that financing of anti-TB program is sustainable. Uh, this financing has to be sustainable irrespective of the number of specialists, number of uh, hospital beds. And one of the elements uh, used to be uh, working with uh, 
NGOs. Working with NGOs is very effective and uh, the results are much more convincing than working with the state. And uh, maybe Belarus could uh, be uh, could uh, offer ground for piloting projects in this respect, working with NGOs. Thank you. Very genuine, very from the heart, and I'm completely impressed with uh, with the Belarusian delegation and your leadership. Thank you. Uh, you want to add something, Timur, to the same question? Go ahead. Yes. Short that we have two more yeah, questions. I, I will try to be short, no more than 45 minutes. Um, actually, responding to the question of sustainability and in, in terms of funding, uh, countries of our region have been receiving global fund uh, money for years. And that allowed governments, in a way, to save certain resources, to actually uh, redirect certain resources for other purposes, like they didn't have to buy drugs, they didn't have to buy diagnostics, so they could save and use this money for something else. Now we are facing the probability that global fund, fund money will be going down and countries will have to take more ownership and more investment into the programs. Um, what I fear is that it will result in countries focusing again on the issues like treatment and diagnosis, prevention. The, the issues that were traditional uh, and the investment into uh, civil society, into the work that civil society is doing will go down. We have the example of Russia. Uh, Global Fund came, up, came out with this NGO rule which exists nowhere in the world, just in Russia. NGO rule meaning that the, the Global Fund continues uh, investing into civil society only, basically giving money to NGOs to do the work in key affected populations. Uh, so I, I really hope that this will not be the, the, the case in other countries and that actually other countries will be mindful of the negative impact it may have if uh, Again, basically, the, the governments go back to the old paradigm, you know, investing in, into the medical response. It will not help for sure. It will basically, uh, again, revive the, the, the problems with access to vulnerable groups. So I really hope that when we speak about financing, you know, and now countries of the region increasingly co go to the idea of social contracting. And this is the concept that exists already in legislations in, in, in most of our countries. I really hope that this social contracting will work in public health, including in TB, and will be directed, at least part of it, will be directed uh, on working with vulnerable communities, supporting NGOs to reach out to vulnerable communities. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead with the question. Uh, dear moderators, dear chair, uh, persons, I'm a, a participant of the Ukrainian delegation to the conference and I would uh, lie on the question on commitment of uh, countries and governments in uh, the fight on uh, tuberculosis. <clears throat> I would like to thank you. Uh, organizers of this excellent summit and especially the ministers of health and deputy ministers who have arrived here to discuss the topical questions and issues on fighting tuberculosis. But unfortunately we de uh, do not see uh, some ministers or their deputies from several countries here. Uh, it's really hard to uh, reprimand them on uh, their absence that ministers of uh, health care are not represented at the top level as the issue of tu uh, tuberculosis and every minister of health care is burdened with a lot and a series of different issues and problems and uh, not always it is tuberculosis only. Thus we are interested in commitment, loyalty of governments, of the ministers of health care, especially to the issue of tuberculosis in particular. How we can achieve that? We can achieve that only in one way, only when civic societies will warm up the internet and uh, express manifest needs or um, 
um, feedback of uh, uh, civic society, of representatives of vulnerable groups, etc. It is impossible without the involvement of uh, civic society. And I would like to share um, uh, the example from Ukraine. Uh, there is a financial reforming in Ukraine undergoing, and the financial means will be rechanneled, especially uh, on behalf and in favor of particular regions. Someone will be subordinate to of the regional governors. For instance, uh, there is 1,200,000 uh, military or warfare uh, uh, refugees. So restoration of uh, industry in the region. Of course, the issue of tuberculosis will not be the top one priority. And uh, it depends on us so that the issue, the problem, the challenge of tuberculosis would not disappear among many different priorities existing, for instance, in uh, post-war or post or uh, current conflict Ukraine. And uh, this is top priority for our commitment and our actions to be taken. Thank you very much for, uh, for bringing uh, this uh, important perspective to us. Uh, go ahead. We have uh, two more hands, so yes, please. Uh, go ahead. Actually, it doesn't work. I'm sorry. Is it better now? Okay. My name is Mariam Sianozov, and I represent NGO Project Hope. And we work with the B control uh, for many years, mainly in Central Asia and in Ukraine, uh, including vulnerable groups. Recently, we also started a program with Global Fund support in Kazakhstan to address TB among migrants. And working with vulnerable groups, we noticed that actually, despite all efforts to integrate primary health care system and healthcare workers from primary health system into TB control, uh, key populations are much better received by healthcare workers in TB services than in primary health care. And even doing focus group with migrants in Kazakhstan, we received more or less similar comments from uh, migrants when we started to interview them. So I wanted to ask my colleagues here if you have similar experience with countries or more European part of the WHO European region and uh, if you have any advices for us how to deal and also to ask Belarus because we have a big representation from the Ministry of Health about situation in your country. Thank you. So I will, uh, I will see if uh, Dr. Professor Abu Bakar and maybe the Minister you have something to share. Right, so I think this goes back to my issue of know your epidemic. I, I suspect that um, the situation would differ by context and by country and that the solution really has to be you tailor the service to meet the needs of the population. I have absolutely no doubt to, in, in my head that the primary responsibility for funding services and initiatives is that of the state, i.e. the government. The most effective way to deliver it may be through the civil society organizations and NGOs, and therefore the state ought to be funding those organizations. Clearly the real world is slightly different, and we have to rely on donors and others to do that, but that does not mean that it's not the responsibility of the state to, to fund it. In terms of um, whether specifically I've encountered the problem you've described, no, I haven't. Anyone? Is there? If, if I can add, excuse me, just maybe to make my point more clear. That uh, speak a bit louder. To, just to make my point more clear, uh, we noticed that that's the kind of stigma among healthcare workers in primary health care towards TB patients coming from key vulnerable groups, which is much worse stigma than for healthcare workers working in TB services. How we can change the situation, that's the point. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Right, so I didn't get that the first time. Um, right, that's not really surprising, is it? That um, even among um, healthcare workers, there's some hierarchy of um, need. Um, what we call in the UK the inverse care law, where you kind of have the poorest communities attracting people who cannot get the high-flying jobs in the top specialties, and therefore the poorest populations get the poorest level of care. Complicating matters is once you then end up in those areas of work and specialties, then um, the same resources that are available to equip people to deliver effective care are not available to those workers. 
and inevitably stigma arises because people aren't equipped to provide the best care and don't have the facilities and training to be able to, de to deal with stigma. In fact, it should be the opposite, i.e. people working in those communities should get more resources than people working in normal systems. And until you can challenge that and resource and incentivize those systems, you are likely to solve that. Regarding the involvement of uh, primary health care networks, yes, sure, they will never be happy to, to have more TB on their uh, territory um, and to have these vulner vulnerable uh, persons that are not always very uh, adherent to treatment. But uh, you have to put them on the same table, at the same table with, with the NTP. Uh, you have to negotiate and you have to open the doors. Uh, in my municipality, we have obtained the commitment of uh, uh, municipal uh, health care services to um, uh, uh, offer services to homeless persons regarding the screening of TB, uh, a diagnosis of TB, uh, and a referral to, to the next institutions. Actually, I think what she encountered was a much more rejection in the primary health care versus in the TB dispensary. So. Yeah, uh, yes, I'm talking about that. Uh, primary health care is not very happy to start to deal yeah. with, with TB uh, patients. They think that's the prerogative of TB doctors. Uh, and you have to negotiate. You have to bring them on board. Yeah. Okay. Minister and then Timur. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, much experience of working with migrants in Belarus because we have very few migrants, maybe now uh, a little bit more due to the situation in the Ukraine. But uh, those who receive the migrant status in Belarus uh, enjoy the same rights as uh, Belarusian citizens and they are entitled to uh, health care. That is why our task is to legalize illegal migrants. And uh, that is how we, uh, and we also work with the International Organization for Migrations. And uh, so we don't see any big problem for us here as far as stigmatization is concerned. Uh, it is the problem associated with pulmonology and physiatricians uh, as well. We uh, uh, have known one another for uh, about 15 years and I think that we all together have, uh, have to uh, find a solution uh, to this issue the, uh, and uh, this service dealing with uh, TB has to be uh, prioritized. And uh, the doctor uh, has certain attitudes and um, I, I experienced that myself when, when I came and I said like, you know, I have HIV and the guy asked me to show my veins, you know, to see if I'm, I'm a drug user or not. Um, actually, what, what I've seen uh, in the past was that uh, social accompaniment, social uh, сопровождение or case management, uh, better known in English, uh, is, is a way that, that really helps um, when doctors know certain representatives, so certain social workers, they have the working relations. This social worker may be from the community, but he or she is empowered, he has the knowledge, the skills uh, to, to talk to doctors um, and that actually helps this person, this social worker to bring someone and to be the bridge between the doctors and the patients. Um, I would say that um, it would be great if WHO comes up with high-level guidelines where it says that you know, it, this practice should be promoted, especially in environments where uh, stigma among, social, uh, among uh, healthcare workers is, is uh, prevalent. But I, I really think that this, this is one of the ways to, to overcome this kind of stigma and sometimes discrimination because stigma is attitude, discrimination is when the doctor says like goodbye, I'm not going to provide you services. And that happens especially with, with like drug users when they cannot 
get uh, TB treatment in a hospital because the hospital says like, you know, you will relapse using drugs, we don't allow using drugs here, so goodbye, you know. So, you know, this moderation could be the, one of the answers. Not the only, not ideal, but one of. Vaira? I would like to add to this discussion that um, very important is um, uh, advocacy, communication, uh, <clears throat> education for uh, society, and from another uh, side, infection control. That first is if uh, society will be uh, very knowledgeable and then understand tuberculosis, uh, then um, and there will be early detection. And now we have a lot of tools new when we can uh, uh, get to diagnosis in, in one day and uh, good treatment, and uh, it's, it's linked with. Uh, uh, rapid diagnosis, rapid treatment brings us to uh, much more better infection control and there is, will not be this um, transmission so, so much. And for medical personnel, for people who work with uh, patients, uh, the, the stigma uh, could be decreased. Thank you. Just to very quickly add one point. So I, I think that um, it does need to be a combination of the two interventions. We need better education of the healthcare workers and you need resources to do that so that you bring them up to a level of knowledge that they would realize actually the risks associated with caring for a TB patient. The alternative of empowering the patient and essentially having a social worker or equivalent to care from them is also critical. Um, one model that we've used in the UK, it's called a peer support. So somebody who's actually been through the same experience accompanying the patient. And objectives eval ob objective evaluations of that intervention have been variable. In some instances, it's worked fantastically well, and in some instances, the results are mixed. And so one has to be careful when you introduce such. Thank you. We have two more questions in the room, one uh, the lady and uh, then our Ukrainian colleague. Can you hear me? Uh, I am, represent East Europe and Central Asia Union of People Living with HIV, and I will speak Russian, sorry. Please take these things. It's, uh, it is a very interesting and important discussion, especially when it comes to uh, vulnerable groups of people. And as a representative of, of the organization of people living with HIV, I am well aware of all the difficulties uh, representatives from vulnerable groups are faced with, uh, be it antiretroviral uh, treatment or TB treatment. Uh, there are lots of different thoughts and ideas how the situation can be changed, but I would like to dwell on the following moments. First, before we talk about financial sustainability of various programs, be it HIV treatment or TB treatment, it is very important to consider those uh, financial assets we uh, use. So we have to optimize the existing resources and direct them uh, where they can uh, produce best results. Uh, referring to the Belarusian experience, uh, you've said that you uh, are gradually uh, passing over to programs mostly uh, targeting uh, inpatient uh, TB treatment. It might be uh, important for other countries as well. And when we see the resources which will be freed from that optimization, we might not need that uh, much. Uh, we might not need so many additional resources, uh, referring to comment by Lasha. And uh, having worked with the problem of HIV AIDS, I would like to say something which might sound not very politically correct. Nevertheless, for uh, the governments of our countries, 
uh, to pay attention to HIV, AIDS, and TB problems, how to put it more politically correctly, uh, appealing to uh, the necessity to observe human rights is not effective enough. And Belarusian experience has shown that the most efficient way is to show how uh, economically uh, viable treatment of this or uh, that uh, group of population is. Let's take a person who is uh, HIV positive, has uh, TB and hepatitis C, what would be economically more profitable? Probably to treat him in one center, to offer all the services in one center. And uh, when we are able to show the results to representatives from our Ministry of Finances, the conversation will take uh, the turn uh, which would be beneficial to us. And I would also like to uh, end uh, drawing your attention to the necessity to estimate the efficiency of this or that program so that we can optimize our resources and that will definitely broaden access uh, for the representatives of vulnerable groups as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah good and practical approach on how we can think of how we can maximize and get the right impact from what we do for sure. Sir, if you want to go ahead. Uh, Andrei uh, Slavutsky, WHO in Ukraine. Uh, I have a quite practical question. We speak about vulnerable groups. We speak about exposure to multiple pathologies not only medical, but also social problems, psychological problems, many, many problems. So it means that behind that, the answer to the um, different problems of a person is different specializations. Should it, just question, should be there any one, one person who is the case manager, kind of? And what is your experience? Should be there one human face that basically dispatches to the uh, different specialists uh, because sometimes we all, we, all of us we, we, we think and uh, that's what happens that the person has in front of them so many faces that basically the person is lost and, does, and, and feels that abandoned and many people is just crowd, you are lost in the crowd. So, and if so, what and who should be this person? Who should be this person? Person from TB, from HIV, from social services, from state, from NGO. Who should be this person, if any? Thank you. Thank you. I think this is a very good question. You see, a lot of what we speak here, and I will ask those of you having experience to answer, so I give you a bit of time to think, is linked in a way to what Lasha was saying. These are all things that can be done. You don't need an investment. It's organizing yourself is you know, deciding, as you say, whatever works the best in order to interact with the patient, is sometimes, as Professor Abubakar mentioned, extending the program that is welcoming and people can go when it's more feasible. This don't cost money. It's a lot that can be done currently. We will see what the experiences are with just people being innovative and thinking out of the box, because you know, there, is in some, there is good knowledge and there are some tools which we can use much better than what we do right now. And what you ask, it's part of that. So I, um, I think I will go with Professor Abubakar and then all of you that want to add something, go ahead. So I, I think I fundamentally believe, um, I'm fundamentally believing it's probably not a good start, um, that you need a key person, a key worker that you relate to, because you have to um, be able to get a person that you recognize that each time you go back to, would understand your issues. I think that person, it almost doesn't matter which bit of the health system it, goes, it, it comes from, whether it's a TB program. I think the issue is how do we integrate these vertical programs that are completely separate so that at the patient, when the patient comes in at the primary healthcare level, that one person has sufficient knowledge of the different streams to work in. 
And within that example of the fine and trade service that I mentioned, they've expanded now and they cover hepatitis and they deal with some HIV, et cetera, and they're doing flu vaccinations. And they've acquired over a few years a large amount of knowledge about all the needs of that population. And therefore, they're able to serve as the first point of contact and support people as appropriate. I think services need to think in that way and develop the model where they support a variety of approaches. I have to admit, though, that there is a certain level of complexity where it becomes impossible, and those would be exceptional. But at that level of complexity, then you'd obviously need more than one key worker. Uh, but that should be the exception, not the rule. Anyone else? Timur, you want to add? Um, I've seen that face already, actually. Um, I mean, for years there have been programs implemented uh, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And um, I have seen when actually there was one face who was the case manager and who was basically leading the, the, the person with the disease through the you know, different services, especially when, when it's not just uh, one medical condition, but several medical conditions at a time. Um, in my experience, that was an NGO uh, per person. Um, a, a person working in an NGO, but um, I would say that I, I don't think that um, always having such a person in a state body, uh, in, a, in a public institution, would be a good idea, especially in context of vulnerable communities, because not necessarily the person will come uh, to this uh, state institution. It's easier actually to, to have um, first, you know, this peer kind of contact. Um, in prison, yes, definitely, there that will be a guard or, you know, but I don't think it's, it's going to be really effective in, in prison settings. But in, um, in, 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 in societies at large, um, definitely, I think there, there should be, not just there could be, but there should be a case, case manager. And uh, it would be ideal if uh, there are people like this, organizations providing these services, uh, throughout the country at, at all levels, not just in the capital, but also in rural areas, you know, so that even in small uh, towns and villages, there is someone who, who you can go to. Not you, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I take the freedom of having a microphone all the time to say that uh, last week I was in South Africa and the South African government launched a, a huge campaign in the vulnerable groups uh, looking at uh, testing and diagnosing mining communities, peri-mining communities and their children, as well as, in, as prisoners. And uh, they uh, um, are working through uh, sort of vans, uh, the same system as uh, Professor Abubakar mentioned, which are able to integrate and look beyond TB, you know, that uh, are doing as well the HIV tests. They are looking now about diabetes and so on, but they are actually mobile units and uh, uh, being equipped with uh, gene expert and as well a few other uh, testing uh, machines that are moving around. And there is indeed a person that is usually a lady that is the one which is the face. And, you know, just even in that little intervention, they were convinced that should be just one that will direct uh, what the, each individual will do and not um, several of them. So I am also a strong believer I think for all of us, it's much more reassuring to have one interface rather than multiple. Uh, if there are no more questions from the room, uh, we have uh, kind of 20 minutes to go. And uh, we are here uh, six, uh, uh, eight, because I, I'm counting as well Professor Kazachkin. And I think the last question that I, I would really like all of us to answer here is, is a sort of pitching uh, to our governments in how do we ensure that we maintain sustainability and focus on the vulnerable groups or if it's not happening, what will be the pitching for investments from the government in the vulnerable groups? What will be that what we can do or how can we advise the governments in a, in a three minutes intervention uh, or two minutes intervention considering we meet a government official um, or your prime minister, minister, uh, in convincing that uh, investing in, 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 in interventions for vulnerable groups is a, is a good way to go forward. So, um, is there anyone that uh, want to break the, the ice? 
I can, I can, I, I, I said that I'm going to say something, so then that gives a bit of time. I will go then, maybe we go in order. Uh, and then we end up with uh, our keynote speaker, Professor Kazachkin. So my, my, uh, my pitch is the fact that um, um, it's very difficult to be part of a vulnerable group, uh, whatever that is. And the stigma associated, associated and, the, and the suffering associated uh, with TB is uh, probably do two times, three times higher when you are for a, from, from a vulnerable group because you, are, you have many other things attached. But the, the reality is that being part of a vulnerable group, you will much likely uh, have um, the very few chances of getting diagnosed and treated. And therefore, you will become you know, a case transmitting to others, and then you will be hum become a case transmitting as well to those that are close to you. So my pitch will be from the government that the, the, my country, which is actually the case, will never be able to achieve any target in TB without addressing the vulnerable groups. There will always be a missing group. There will always be a high defaulting group. There will always be, therefore, a big impact on the MDRTB cases and XDRTB cases because of the lack of attention of these groups. And then I'll go probably with some financial figures. So let's see, Professor. So I'll make three points. I like three. Um, the first one um, relates to advocacy. I think we should all be advocates, irrespective of what your job is. Um, and whenever the opportunity arises, make the point that this is important. Um, you don't know who you're speaking to, who will then go on to make the difference. Um, I'll give one example why I think that's important. So with our national strategy, we've been sitting on all of the evidence and the document written up, and we're waiting to clear the funding because we wanted a funded national strategy. And it turns out that it's an individual physician who had a patient who spoke to the patient and it turned out that the patient's parent is a high profile um, public figure who then wrote a letter to our prime minister and within days it got sorted. Chance, it happens um, and sometimes that's what you need. The second thing I think you need is you, we wouldn't be there if we didn't do the research and estimated the size of the problem what the solutions are and what's the evidence-based solution to the problem because it makes it more difficult to articulate the need in a vulnerable population if you cannot show that this population is disproportionately affected, they have the highest levels of drug resistance and while things like discovering the next vaccine is critical and important to the global TB problem, if we don't solve the problem in this population and we just introduce new drugs, what are we going to do? We are just going to basically lose them. So I think it is, this population is so critical to get right. The last and final point is actually being clear about how much you need so that you are not uh, vague in your requests and costing that appropriately so that it links back to the solution, not just in the governmental services, but all the resources you need, including those in the uh, civil society sector. Thank you. Possible. Thank you so much. I'm sitting here and I uh, understand that we have internet uh, streaming and if the Minister of Health of Belarus is listening to and what I will do doing if I present opinion, uh, my personal opinion instead of official. But I would like to mention several things. Of course, we require to mention to politicians that tuberculosis is a general disease and uh, those uh, stigmatization of symptoms is also characteristic irrespective of a particular group of uh, uh, society, whether a person uh, belongs to some particular privileged group or not. Of course, um, addressing vulnerable uh, groups uh, is a deficiency of commitment on behalf of uh, the state and of a civic society as such. And even if there is, um, so this, there is a huge spread among uh, citizens and population with low income and high income, so perhaps um, the increased risk uh, or uh, especially vulnerable groups uh, are different. And uh, the fourth I would like to mention is that reasonable and targeted ear market uh, marked financing for solving the pro uh, problem leads to effective and sustainable result and those uh, that money is not uh, spoiled or uh, used in vain um, starting from the um, 
presentation of um, our former patient uh, mentioning this and indicating discrepancies and failures of our healthcare system and um, fighting our presumption that tuberculosis uh, has some age-related symptoms or uh, subordination. So as regards strategy for 2020, in any way it has only um, leading or driving uh, guidelines for solving problem. Perhaps a universal mechanism for uh, fighting tuberculosis uh, exceeds the sphere or field of healthcare only and has many different social aspects. Very much. I think if the minister is watching, he should be very proud of you. So, if anything, so well done. <laughs> Lilian. Yeah, I wanted just to add that um, we cannot fight TB among vulnerable groups of population without bringing uh, a strong social support for them. We cannot deal with tuberculosis without solving all those priorities or the main priorities that the patients have. Um, and we can uh, have these resources by being more uh, um, being more courage, uh, having more courage uh, on optim uh, optimizing the existing practices. Uh, we have to reduce the beds, we have to uh, review our e existing tools, and thus we can uh, obtain more resources that can be allocated to social support. Thank you, Timur. Um, well, I think that uh, it would help uh, a lot if uh, our countries undertake legal reforms so that um, vulnerable gr groups are not criminalized um, because basically by criminalizing by outlawing cer certain groups we face the need to invest more in more expensive outreach programs for example uh, if uh, people who use drugs are criminalized, uh, they will avoid going to, to medical services provided by the state because they will fear being reported as a drug user and having problems with police. So reforming this system, getting rid of the need basically to, you know, to put in prison in order to correct someone, I think that will save a lot of money and will actually uh, let us much easier work with with populations and uh, you know instead of having them really like vulnerable vulnerable to at least reduce the this vulnerability to reduce the marginalization of these groups um, another thing I, I i also join my voice to saying how important it is to uh, move from uh, in hospital to outpatient treatment and one of the arguments I would like to add is something that is not my knowledge, I'm not a health expert, but something that I heard from uh, a uh, chief uh, lung disease doctor of, of my country. And she said that basically the research is showing that hospital is the best way to transmit MDRTB. And actually most of MDRTB cases, you know, when you, when you really look at people who have MDRTB, Sometimes it's surprisingly that uh, it's, it comes as a surprise that actually they, they got this MDR in the hospital while they were being treated for regular drug susceptible TB. So I would say that uh, that is not needed just for the sake of saving money, but also for the sake of reversing the, the epidemic. Um, and uh, finally, I would like to sing my old song about uh, investing into communities and civil societies because I think that this is a prerequisite for an effective response. Without doing that, I don't think we will be able to really uh, stop the epidemic, stop TB. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, passing the microphone to my co-chair. <laughs> would you? Uh, well, I said at the beginning I would try and summarize, didn't I? <laughs> okay, then good. Then we'll have Michelle. Uh, we started with Michelle, we, we closed Michelle, with Michelle the interventions from uh, our guests and then you will summarize. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, first let me say I agree if with everyone's comments in answer to your uh, question, Lucica, and just put it in, in uh, if your question was how would you speak to the government? 
I would say first I would uh, go to the I would go to the Minister of Health because that's the usual port of entry for us. Uh, I would speak as you um, which said you would speak, Lucica, and I would say know your epidemics, uh, and then build a health system that is for the patients and don't expect the patients to adapt to your health system um, and make sure um, the system uh, for the vulnerable group is accessible, affordable, and acceptable. I would then try and see the Prime Minister <laughs> because the main message I think is that, as I said, health is about politics, health is about inequities, and TB is really the key example there. And I would say this is not an area just for the Minister of Health. And if we think of Eastern and Central Europe, there is a long tradition that actually the government would say, here is your budget, Mr. Minister of Health, please deal with this. Uh, whereas this is an issue, as I said in my remarks, of a whole of government. So I would really plea for a whole of government response. And then there are two other things I would say to the Prime Minister. One is invest in mechanisms that would allow to fund the NGOs. And we are at a critical time when the Global Fund is leaving many countries in Eastern Europe at a critical time when some of the governments have the mechanisms and are not funding the NGOs, but in some countries we do not even have a public mechanism that would allow the government to fund the NGOs and the necessary legislative and policy measures have to be taken. And the other thing that I would go for with the Prime Minister is what Timur was saying, which is look at what the evidence is that some of the laws and policies that criminalize people, how over-incarceration for people who use drugs, for example, impacts on the incidence and prevalence of disease uh, and, and try and argue for that. So that's a way of sort of putting together a lot of what you said and thank you for, for the panel, that was fantastic. I'm beginning to regret that I said I would uh, try and summarize what has been a fascinating and wide range discussion. And I think Michelle actually has caught a lot of the key points I was going to make. But um, we started off with Michelle pointing out to us that vulnerable groups face a wide range of problems, a multiplicity of problems, both in terms of what it can mean for their TB disease, its progression, their stigmatization. But I think then as our discussion went on, we we recognize that these vulnerable groups face a wide range of problems beyond TB as well. Um, and that uh, we need to think about vulnerable groups in terms of a wider societal issue. And I think that was the common theme that came through the first part of the discussion, is that really with vulnerable groups, we should not be focusing on the medical, just on the medical problem of managing TB. That we should be demedicalizing <coughs> where necessary, we should be looking at setting up ways of making it easier for them to access services. So we heard about one-stop shops, outreach services. Um, we need to recognize the wider societal issues that they face and help them to deal with those as part of the management of those individuals. Um, we had some fantastic examples from Belarus about reducing alcohol intake. I wasn't sure whether that was reducing by two liters a day, a week, a month, or a year. <clears throat> now, I hope it wasn't today, that would be impressive. Um, but, uh, uh, but with some really nice examples from what you've achieved in Belarus is, as part of that process. Um, and I think it was Ibrahim who said, know your epidemic, know the, the patient group. And I think that one of the key messages from that is a group that can really help, or organizations that can really help us with this, are the NGOs. They really they work with these, these vulnerable groups. They can help us define the, the groups that we need to work with. So focusing on the medical problems. We then very briefly talked about the importance of operational research uh, in terms of <clears throat> providing us with evidence of how the tools and strategies we've currently got can work 
and can work best because that's what, that's what we've got to work with. We don't have new drugs. We don't have new vaccines. We hopefully will do in the, in the medium to longer term future. But what we've got right now is what we've got and we need to make it work better. And operational research is an important part of that and it should be invested in, in the same way as we're investing in vaccine research. Um, stigma is a big issue. It's a barrier. It's a problem for these vulnerable groups. They come to health services with stigma because of their vulnerable group status. Uh, TB can add to that. And we had some interesting discussion about things that might be done to help with that. So we talked about the case manager model where a healthcare worker, for example, um, or an NGO advocate could actually help the patient work their way through the system. Um, we heard about the possibility of peer or patient support, people who've had TB been through their system to help those through. And we also talked about the importance in terms of, of stigma of legal issues and legal issues. And I think the, the last example is, is, is the best. It's about decriminalizing injecting drug use because criminalized injecting drug use has two major negative effects. One, it may make people avoid seeking treatment. And secondly, if someone is then put in prison because of injecting use, then prison just simply makes the whole issue of TB and TB transmission worse. So that seems to me an easy thing to say should be done. Easy to say, hard to do perhaps. Um, and then we also talked about the fact that access to health care and the right to health are fundamental human rights. And Michelle, you started us off with that point and we kind of came back to it at the end. Um, and there's a clear role for governments in that. Governments to promote health as a human right and access to health care as part of addressing the issue of vulnerable groups for whom both health and access to health care is an issue. And that's where it can come together. And I think perhaps just finally, there was a word of caution that actually advocating for human rights on health may not always win the day, that actually making it clear that actually it makes health economic sense to do a lot of these things may carry weight with governments. So perhaps first see your Minister of Health. If that doesn't work, see the Prime Minister. And if that doesn't work, see the Minister of Finance. So with that, I'd like to thank the panel for a fascinating, excellent discussion. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> so thank you, thank you co-chairs and panelists uh, for this afternoon sessions and uh, we are happy that uh, this conference hall is with so many people that it shows that its problem is very important indeed. Um, dear colleagues, uh, we have finished our first technical day and I would like to inform that dinner will, will be served at 7 p.m. at Redison SIS Daugava is quite uh, near uh, or close to the National Library. It's closer by foot, even by car. You just uh, can go outside, cross big street and, and 200, after 200 meters on the river bank there will be Radisson SIS uh, hotel, but um, for th those who are not sure finding the uh, right way themselves, please, uh, our colleagues will meet uh, outside National Library at 6.40, 20 minutes to 7, 6.40 outside, and then you will be guided to the dinner room. So, thank you very much for this day and meet uh, at the dinner or tomorrow morning at 9 p.m. Thank you very much. <laughs>